Welcome back. Some of you may have seen my post that I was going to be exploring from my book of secret societies for this week's video. Now there are of course the obvious ones, the Illuminati, the KKK, the Freemasons, but I found a few that I have never heard of before, and if you're new here, that's sort of my thing. So let's dive in. First up, the Holy Vem. 13th century Germany. These Christian police were formed in Germany in an effort to create law and order during a time of chaos. What began as a societal necessity quickly became a corrupt secret organization. They became the judge, jury, and executioners of the guilty and the innocent, working in the shadows to promote their own personal agendas. So what could go wrong? I mean, we all see what happens when you let angry, power-hungry people throw out their version of justice with absolutely no consequence for themselves. Germany was in utter chaos. Men were robbed, beaten, and murdered. People who said they were Christian committed sacrilege. There was anarchy everywhere until a group of men formed a secret society and named themselves the Holy Them. Their goal? Public vengeance, and they dedicated themselves to murdering anyone who might be a heretic. In the beginning, these self-initiated men received the blessings of both the emperor and the church. They were permitted to seek out wrongdoers, judge them, and execute them as they saw fit. Over time, they grew powerful, and the people feared them. Power and corruption plagued the Vem as many criminals felt the only way to avoid being killed by them was to join them. By the 14th century, the Vem had over 100,000 members. So I guess it wasn't much of a secret anymore, was it? First and foremost, all men seeking admittance into the Holy Vem were made to swear to uphold the Christian religion and the Ten Commandments. Members of the Holy Vem had to keep their identity secret so that outlaws could not seek them out and destroy them. As a part of their oath, each initiate also had to swear that he would kill his family and himself if it was ever revealed he was a member of the Vem. The oath was then sealed with the initiate's own blood as a witnessing judge drew a sword blade across his throat. Afterward, the initiate would kiss the hilt of the sword to seal the deal. The trials of the Vem were similar to those of accused witches. So pure logic then, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well, anyone accused of almost anything could be brought to the trial. Running away from the Vem was nearly impossible. When the assumed guilty person was captured, the Vem would call a meeting in the village Every man had to appear at this trial meeting or risk being put to death for failure to show support for the Vem. The guilty person was made to listen to the accusations and the verdict. He or she was given little to no opportunity to declare innocence to the hooded judges and executioners. After the verdict was passed, the accused was given punishment. Of course, that sounds fair, right? Another method the Vem used to discover whether the accused was innocent or guilty was the trial by iron. The accused had to first wash his hands in water while a bar of iron was heated up until it glowed red. The accused then had to grab hold of the glowing metal with his bare hands and walk nine paces. If the accused could accomplish this without getting burnt, he was innocent. Of course, no one could pass this trial, so the accused underwent torture in order to be declared guilty, no matter what the actual truth was. As soon as the Vem decided a person was guilty, there would be no innocence for the accused. In the rare event when a friend or a witness for the accused would be brave enough to stand up and speak on their behalf, it never ended well. The accused would be found guilty and the person defending the accused would be hung for lying to the Holy Vem. An even rarer event 
was when the Vem would not agree on whether the accused was guilty or innocent. In this case, the accused would still be hung so as to protect the secrecy of the Vem. The Vem took pleasure in causing as much pain to their victims as was humanly possible. For something minor, they might break the legs of the accused. For major crimes, such as sacrilege or arbitrary eccentricity, the punishment was incredibly severe. The accused, whether guilty or not, was taken to a torture chamber to be slowly killed in some terrible way. On other occasions, the accused was merely strung up to a tree. One notable way the Vem enjoyed tormenting and killing their victims was with the use of a spiked casket. Not surprisingly, the Vem are the ones who invented this device to cause as much terror and pain in the victim and populace as possible. The Vem knew that they could rule over people through fear alone. It is believed that in some cases those who were sentenced to death had a choice between torture or something called vulgar free, free as a bird. If the victim chose this, he was let go from his restraints and was given a head start run. After that initial head start, the Vem were free to literally hunt the accused down like an animal. It is unknown how often this punishment was chosen by the Vem's victims, but it is easy to see how they would prefer to be hunted down than slowly die in a torture chamber. At least in the hunt, the victim has a small amount of hope to possibly escape the Vem's wrath. The Vem had their own secret informants. These informants were strategically placed to keep watch over the common people. If anything suspicious would happen, or if there was a rumor about someone, the informants would contact the Vem. The Vem would arrive and block off the exits from town to make sure no one escaped. The informants would mingle unknown among the people. They would pull them into conversations and try to learn all the rumors being spread throughout the town. This way, they could weed out anyone deemed guilty of any crime, real or religiously based. The strength and terror of the Holy Vem lasted well into the 16th century, but by the 17th century, their numbers began to decline. By the 18th century, there were very few left, and finally by 1811, the French had abolished their secret tribunals. Some say that Napoleon rooted out the very last of the Vems when he invaded Germany. Others claim that the Vems merely went deeper underground and that the secret society remained in existence right up until the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party. The Vem were known for their secret tribunals. They would try the accused in a closed trial and sometimes pass sentencing without the accused being present. After the punishment was passed, a summons would go out, and the accused would be sought, dragged to the nearest tree, and hung. The history and methods of the Vem intrigued Nazi Germany. It is believed by some historians that the Nazi party brought the Vem out of hiding so that they could act against the Jewish people, charging them with hearsay and killing them off like they did in earlier centuries. Other historians believe that the Vem were merely an inspiration for certain members of the Nazi party and that the actually holy Vem are long extinct. However, it is said that if you see someone aligning all of their cutlery so that it is pointed to the center of the table like the spokes of a wheel, that they are indeed a member of this ancient order displaying their membership to other allies. Perhaps if this group does indeed still exist, then they should be aware of the next group, as it poses a serious threat to us all right now. The Bilderberg Group. If I go missing, this will be why. The Bilderberg Group is a private, invitation-only conference comprised predominantly of North America and European elites. The annual conference hosts anywhere between 120 and 150 
political leaders. Others invited to the meetings are experts from industry, finance, academia, and media. According to the official website of the Bilderberg meetings, the purpose of the conference acts as an informal forum meant to foster dialogue between Europe and North America. A list of participants is made public, and the meeting places vary each year and can take place anywhere in North America or Eurasia. Some of this year's members were U.S. Senator of South Carolina Lindsey Graham, Chinese diplomat and ambassador to the U.S., the former CEO of Arconic Clause Christian Kleinfeld and columnist for the Wall Street Journal Peggy Noonan. The group's original goal of promoting Atlanticism, of strengthening U.S.-European relations, and preventing another world war has grown. The Bilderberg Group's theme is to bolster a consensus around free market Western capitalism and its interests around the globe. In 2001, Dennis Healy, a Bilderberg Group founder and a steering committee member for 30 years said, to say we were striving for a one world government is exaggerated, but not wholly unfair. In other words, they didn't seem to shy away from the fact that their intentions are not to create a new world order. Partly because of its working methods to ensure strict privacy and secrecy, the Bilderberg Group has been criticized for its lack of transparency and accountability. The undisclosed nature of the proceedings has given rise to several conspiracy theory, which have been popular at both extremes of the political spectrum. Although there is disagreement about the exact nature of the group's intentions, some on the left accuse the Bilderberg Group of conspiring to impose capitalist domination, while some on the right have accused the group of conspiring to impose a world government and planned economy. Neither one sounds very good. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but if Fidel Castro says a group is up to no good, you might want to listen to what he has to say. In August 2010, former Cuban President Fidel Castro wrote an article for the Cuban Communist Party newspaper, in which he cited Daniel Eustelin's 2006 book The Secrets of the Bilderberg Club, which as quoted by Castro describes sinister cliques and the Bilderberg lobbyists manipulating the public to install a world government that knows no borders and is not accountable to anyone but its own self. The more you dig, the deeper it goes. These meetings are held with tight security and police protection. There are no notes taken, and no one is allowed to discuss what the meetings were about or what was discussed. This group deserves its own series of videos, but I fear I might be hunted down or honestly drive myself insane of what I find. Lastly, but certainly not any less dangerous, the Order of Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones is an undergraduate senior society located at Yale University. The society was founded by William Huntington Russell and Alfonso Taft in 1832. After a dispute broke out among Yale debating societies, Lenonia Brothers in Unity and the Colopian Society, the Society's alumni organization, the Russell Trust Association, owns the group's real estate and oversees the organization. The Skull and Bones headquarters, a windowless brownstone hall on 64 High Street, is named the Tomb. Skull and Bones is known informally as Bones, and its members are known as Bonesmen. Since its inclusion of women in 1991, the Society selects 15 junior men and women to join every spring as part of Yale University's TAP Day. That day it taps or chooses those it views as campus leaders and notable figures. There have been many prominent members of Skull and Bones, like former President William Howard Taft, three subsequent generations of the Bush family, ending with former President George W. Bush, political reporter for the Washington Post Dana Milibank, and former U.S. Ambassador to Poland and former Knoxville Mayor Victor Ashe. Seems somewhat harmless, right? Until you dig just a little deeper and find that this secret society is famous for being part of a number of conspiracy theories. The most popular being that founders of the CIA were members of this group. 
infamous for hiding the deep, dark secrets of sick practices members take part in. Oh, and you know the windowless building? Yeah. Deep inside its walls, some say weird sexual acts are also common sight at the Order of Skull and Bones. As part of their initiation ceremony, new members are asked to lie naked in coffins before telling others about their deepest and darkest sexual secrets. Awesome. A word to the wise. If you know someone who is a member, I might refrain from shaking their hands unless you witnessed a good and thorough cleansing. Ew. Why are almost all secret society's members sexual deviants? And why on earth are they in charge of anything? I think it's time to start my own secret society, and it's going to involve a blue light. If you aren't sure what I mean by that, Google is your friend on that one, unlike the secret societies mentioned here. See you next time.